Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it's good to be here. It's good to be in your house. It's good to be with people that we can trust. And it's good to be with people that love us. We pray now that as we study your word, that you'll open our hearts and you'll open our minds. Help us to understand your great love. Help us uh, to have the courage to put that great love into action. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our study of the Gospel of Luke, going through verse by verse. And this morning's passage that Mark just read to you is the story of Jesus' interaction with this man who is demon-possessed. And what you need to know about this passage is that it is, uh, it is connected to the passage that immediately follows, or I mean immediately precedes, this passage. And so immediately prior to this story, uh, we have the story of Jesus getting into the boat with his disciples, and they're headed out onto the lake, and a storm arises. And in the midst of that storm, uh, Jesus is asleep. And he's not concerned about the storm at all. But the storm becomes so great that the boat is being swamped. And the disciples, rather than take hope in the fact that Jesus is there with them in the boat, they freak out. And they are convinced that they're going to drown. And so they uh, wake Jesus up in panic. Jesus commands the wind and the waves to be still. And of course, the wind and the waves obey. And the disciples are challenged by Jesus and by him asking them, where is your faith? And the Disciples, the story ends with the disciples being in awe of Jesus' power, of God's power put on display in Jesus that even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, in today's passage of scripture, we see God's power put on display. Now, I don't know whether you believe in demon possession or not. That's kind of immaterial to this morning's lesson. What you can probably agree with me, though, is that evil in our world is real. People do horrible things to other human beings. We're seeing that played out across the oceans, and we've seen it played out in our little communities. Evil is real. And we see the face of evil put on display in this passage in one man's life particularly, and the power that that evil has to destroy and confuse and create utter chaos. But in light of that power, we see that God's power is greater, and God's power is put on display. And in fact, that's what this message this morning is all about. It is about God's power. And so we begin with verse 26. Now, Jesus makes the disciples get back into the boat. You know that old adage, if you fall off the horse, you have to get right back on? Yeah, it's an idiom, and uh, this is exactly what's happening. They, they just had an experience, a bad experience in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus the next day says, hey, get back in the boat. It's time to go. And we're going over to the region of the Gerasenes. Now, oh, many of you remember the fist map that I had you make back in August? So if you hold your right hand up in front of you and you make a fist, you, uh, oh, you have the perfect shape of the Sea of Galilee. And oh, right where your thumb is on the, oh, on the side of your fist, that's where the town of Capernaum is. Now, Capernaum is Jesus' base of operations. This is where a lot of the stories uh, that we have of Jesus' life take place in Capernaum. If you go on a diagonal from where your thumb ends across your fist to the back of your hand, about the four o'clock position, that's the region of the Gerasenes. This is Gentile territory. It's Samaritan territory. It's enemy territory. This is the place where, if you're a good Jew, you don't go. In fact, it's 
quite possible that as the disciples are getting into the boat, and Jesus says we're going over to the region of the Gerasenes, that none of the disciples have ever been there. Because it's enemy territory. Well, in verse uh, 28, I'm sorry, in verse 27, we find that uh, when Jesus and the disciples arrive on shore, that they have quite the welcome wagon. In fact, they're greeted by a man who is a hulk of a man. He's huge, and he is screaming, and he's demon-possessed, and on top of all that, he's naked. Now that would be, I don't know about you, but that might be enough to make me push the boat back from the shore and just keep right on sailing. But that's not what happens in our passage. No, because this is Jesus. This is our Lord in the boat. And this is the same Jesus to whom the scriptures say that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he, Jesus, is Lord. That he alone is Lord. And we see that played out in the very next verse. In verse 28, it tells us that the demon knows who Jesus is, and he has to bow. He throws the man down at Jesus' feet. And he acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. Now, part of verse 27 and verse 28 tell us how much destruction evil has played in this man's life. I mean, he's, he's barely living. He's alone. He's naked. He's living in a cemetery. He's been chained, locked up, put under guard. And worst of all, this man has no control over his own actions. His life is completely taken over. I want to tell you a story that's kind of similar. This is a story of a man that, that I met when I was in my 20s. And he was so addicted to alcohol that he told me he would do just about anything to get another drink. Uh, he told me that one time he was so desperate for alcohol that he drank rubbing alcohol. This man... Uh, had a, a troubled past, and, uh, and that contributed to his pain of his present condition, and he went into the military. He faced the choice that, uh, that many people, young people sometimes face, that if, you, if I don't end up in military, I'm going to end up in jail. And so he went into the military, and, and he said that he soon found himself stationed in South Korea and working at the milita uh, demilitarized zone. And while he was there, he said there was a ready supply of drugs. And so my alcoholism went into drug addiction. And he said, I would pretty, pretty much do anything to stay drunk or to get high. He said, many times when I was on guard duty in the middle of the night, I was both drunk and high. I would fall asleep on guard duty. He said, when I was on weekend leave, I would go into Seoul, South Korea. He said, and I would find the closest whorehouse. I would take my cash, my paycheck. I would hand them my paycheck. And I would, they would keep me supplied in drugs and alcohol and sex for the entire weekend. He said, I always saved just enough so that when I left I could stop at the tattoo parlor and before I had to report back to base and I would get another tattoo to document my weekend because I was so drunk and high that I didn't remember it. And when I met him, he was tattooed from his knuckles all the way up both arms, uh, full sleeve on both arms, all the way across his chest, back, all the way up to his jawline. He said, I would do pretty much anything to stay drunk and to get high. He was eventually dishonorably discharged uh, for uh, beating a fellow soldier so badly that he ended up in the hospital. 
he asked the soldier if he could bum smoke, and the soldier told him no, and he got mad, and he beat him up, put him in the hospital. He went to, he was discharged, he went to his uh, hometown, where his family quickly wrote him off, and he found himself homeless, and in and out of jail for many violent acts, both burglary and robbery, armed assault. He was stabbed on several occasions. And finally, one night, he was so drunk and so high as he was walking across an overpass in the city where he was living, uh, barely. He, uh, he said, I contemplated throwing myself off the overpass. He said, but I couldn't even do that because I was so drunk and so high that I lost my balance and I stumbled down the embankment. He said, and then I rolled and tumbled and somersaulted and finally, like 60 some feet below, finally came to a dead stop. He said, and when I landed, I couldn't move. I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't move my legs, my hands and feet wouldn't move. He said, I was so paralyzed, I couldn't even blink. There were some homeless men that were living under the overpass. And so they came down to see what all the commotion was. He said, they, I could hear them talking, and I could see them, but I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. He said, and the, men, the homeless men looked at me, and they assumed that I was dead. So they took my coat, they took my shoes, they rifled through my pockets, and because they didn't want to look at a dead man, they decided to just cover me with a cardboard box. And so my friend told me at this point, he said, all I wanted to do was just cry. I figured this was the end. This was going to be the end of me. He said, but I couldn't even cry because I couldn't blink. He said, and in that moment, he said a bright light appeared. He said, and I thought that I had probably lost consciousness because when I fell down the embankment, it was at night. He said, and, and when the bright light appeared, I assumed that somebody had moved the cardboard box and it was the sunshine. He said, but it, it wasn't. It was just a bright light. And he said, and then I saw a man and that man was walking towards me. He said, and I instantly knew that that man was Jesus. And then Jesus said to me, Scott, what are you doing here? I have so much more for you than this. And then the light was gone. Jesus was gone. And Scott said, suddenly I could feel my body restored to me. I could, I could move my hands and my feet. I could blink again. And I, he said, I sat straight up and he said, I freaked the other homeless guys out because they thought that I was dead and now a dead guy is sitting up. He said, I, I got to my feet, I climbed up that embankment and I walked into town because I knew there was a mission in that town for homeless men and women. He said, and I checked myself into rehab. Now, just like the man in our scripture passage today, my friend was haunted by doing terrible things. And he had thousands of memories that reminded him of how broken he was. And just like the man in our scripture passage today, Jesus came to save him. In verse 20, 32 and 33, we have the incident of the thousands of demons that were in this man be, receiving permission from Jesus to go into the pigs. And it seems a little strange that Luke includes this detail for us. But here's what I think we're supposed to take from that. A thousand plus demons coming out of this man and going into the pigs. What is the pigs' immediate reaction? Chaos and to jump off a cliff to commit suicide. And I think what we're supposed to take away from that is simply this. Imagine what the torture of this man must have been like to have a thousand plus demons inside of him. Imagine 
the pain and the suffering and the chaos and the utter terror that was his daily life. And he couldn't escape. But the good news is, is that Jesus came looking. And Jesus found him. Jesus came to save him and save him, heal him, is exactly what he did. Well, verse 34 and 35 tell us that those who were watching the herd uh, of pigs go into town and to report what has happened. And then all the townspeople come out to see for themselves. And what do they find? Well, they find this man dressed, calm, in his right mind, and sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus teach. Now, I didn't know Scott when he was an alcohol, drug, addicted individual, and the terror that was his life. And I can only imagine what it must have been like to have a run-in with my friend Scott. I wouldn't want to meet Scott in a dark alley. These townspeople, they know this man. They know what family he's from. They know his mother and father and maybe his sisters and brothers. Maybe some of these townspeople have been the ones who tried to chain him up. Maybe this, uh, these townspeople are some of the people that this man terrorized for quite some time. And so, when they come and they see this man in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, they're forced with a decision to make. Do they praise God, give God the credit, celebrate with this man for the healing that he has experienced? Or, do they give in to fear? You see, it's the, the same decision that the disciples had to face in the boat during the storm. For all of us, storms of life happen. And even though Jesus was there in the disciples' midst, they chose fear over faith. And the townspeople here have the exact same opportunity. Jesus is there in their midst. His only agenda is to heal. His only agenda is to point people into a relationship with God. He has no other agenda. And the scriptures are clear that Jesus in other towns has healed sick people. He has restored sight to blind people. He has helped lame people walk again. He's even raised a dead son and restored him to his mother. And here in this town, he has taken a man that everyone knew was a terror and has turned him into a productive person who could be normal again. And the townspeople have a decision to make. Do we celebrate and choose faith or do we give in to fear? Now, verse 37, I think, is one of the saddest verses in the New Testament. Because verse 37 reads like this. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. This is tragic. It's sad. A human being's life has been saved, dramatically changed, and the one who changed it is there in front of them, with them, and they choose fear. Now we said last week that, that fear is a very poor basis upon which to make decisions. And of course, sitting here this morning, it's easy to second guess and to uh, have 2020 hindsight and to play armchair quarterback this morning and, and pass judgment on these townspeople for their decision of choosing fear instead of faith. But the bottom line question for us this morning is this. Would we do any different? 
Notice in verse 37, Jesus doesn't put up a fight. Jesus doesn't argue with them. Jesus doesn't try to force his teaching upon them. When they ask him to leave, he simply gets in the boat. And he leaves. But he leaves them with a witness. You know, my friend Scott, he could have written off his experience with Jesus as just a bad batch of drugs, a bad trip. And not gone to rehab. Not chosen to give his life to Jesus, to follow him. But, Jesus, but Scott chose absolutely to follow Jesus. And we must do the same. Thank the Lord above that we don't have to hit rock bottom like Scott did. Or like the man in our scripture lesson today. And as we come to the communion table this morning, we are reminded of the choices that we have to make. You see, Jesus made choices as well. Jesus chose to go to the cross. He chose to be obedient to his Father in heaven. He chose to die for our sins so that we might be saved. He came looking for us to save us, just as he did for this man who was alone and tortured and everyone else had written off. That famous story of, of the shepherd going to look for the one lost sheep when he has 99 safe in the sheep pen. This is in a perfect example of the good shepherd, our Savior Jesus, doing exactly what he taught. Going into enemy territory, looking for the one that was lost. And so will we choose faith over fear? I once asked my friend Scott, what made you decide to get up and throw off that piece of cardboard and to walk into town and to check yourself into rehab? And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said this, in my utter filth and depravity, in my disgusting existence and poor excuse for a life, Jesus came to find me and call me. How could I choose anything else but him? I believe it's the same for this demon-possessed man in our scripture lesson today. He literally was a walking dead man living in the tombs. And Jesus came to find him. Jesus came to save him. And he chose Jesus in return. Our scripture lesson today is about God's display of power and his ability to change the course of a human life, and not just a human's life, but all humanity for all times. And Jesus, when he left that region, when he didn't fight with them, when they asked him to leave because of the, out of fear, he just got into the boat and left, but he left them a witness. He left them this man, and he told the man, tell, tell everyone what God has done for you. And so as we come to the communion table this morning, it's a reminder, it's a witness of what Jesus has done for us. Maybe at your point in your life right now, you need Jesus to come find you. You need Jesus to remind you that he has so much more for you. Maybe you need to hear this morning that Jesus loves you and that Jesus absolutely saves. I know for all of us, we need to be reminded as we gather around the communion table that our God is faithful and that we're called to respond out of faith in the decisions that we make, in the conversations that we have, 
in the way that we live with one another, we must choose faith and not give in to fear. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your truth found in this uh, scripture passage this morning, and we pray that we would hear its truth and we would put it into action. Lord God, we need your strength to do that. We need your guidance, and thank you, thank you that you absolutely save. We pray this now in Jesus' name. The people of the Peach Bottom Charge of the United Methodist Church pray that you found today's message to be one of encouragement, one of challenge, and one that made you or helped you grow in your faith. If you'd ever like to know more about what a life of following Jesus is like, we pray that you would consider joining us on Sunday morning. Mount Olivet meets at 845. Bryansville meets at 945, and Mount Nebo meets at 11 o'clock. You'd be welcome at all three churches, and you will find in us not a people who live perfectly, but a people who show grace to one another, because God's grace is for everyone.